morning. Thank you, Dale, choir, orchestra. Thank you for being here this morning. And I want to say uh, happy Mother's Day uh, to you ladies. I believe there's not a harder job uh, on the planet than to be a mom. And so we hope that you feel honored this morning and, and celebrated here. And if you're a lady and you're, you're not a mom, we want to honor you as well because we are uh, created uh, in the image of God. And that means that uh, we each have value, we each have uh, significance, and so I, I pray that you have a wonderful, wonderful day. So thank you for being here. And if you are a guest of ours, let me just tell you what we've been doing the last several weeks. We're in the middle of a series of messages that uh, I'm calling Affirmations. These are crucial and important doctrines that we believe as the body of Christ, as the church uh, here at Walnut Street. And so far, we've, we've walked through a number of them. We've we talked about the Bible. We talked about the Trinity, what we believe about the Trinity. We've talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this morning, we're talking specifically about man. So if you have your little insert there, I want you to pull that out. And I want you to follow along uh, as I, re I read our affirmation for this morning. We affirm that God created man, male and female, in his own image. God created man free from original sin, that man might have perfect fellowship with God and steward his creation. However, tempted by Satan, the author of sin, man rebelled against God's command. And by his rebellion, man inherited a nature that is corrupt and wholly opposed to God. Therefore, man is separated from fellowship with God and is under just condemnation of his wrath. Apart from a special work of grace, man is utterly incapable of returning to God. Man's sinfulness extends to his mind, his will, and affections. The unregenerate man lives under the dominion of sin and Satan and is at enmity with God. Thus, all people, regardless of their character or merit, are lost and without hope apart from salvation in Christ. There's an Illinois man who left the snow-filled streets of Chicago to go on uh, vacation uh, in Florida. His wife was supposed to meet him there uh, the next day. She was on a business trip, and so he gets into the hotel. He, he checks in, and he thought he would just send his wife a quick email just to let her know that he was okay. But he, he couldn't quite remember her email address, and he couldn't find the scrap of paper that he wrote it down on, and, and so he tried to type it uh, from memory. Well, he left out one letter, and he uh, accidentally sent his email to an, an elderly lady who had just lost her husband about two days before. And so she pulls up the screen, she reads the email, she lets out a scream, and she faints on the floor. And her family, who was with her, they came into the room, and they looked at the screen, and here's what they saw. Dearest wife, just got checked in. Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Your loving husband. P.S. It sure is hot down here. Now, I I'm afraid... That that's the way a lot of people treat uh, salvation. Now, I, I'm afraid that there are a lot of people who have really not heard uh, the news. B because here's the thing. Uh, salvation is both, you would agree, about good news, but it's also about bad news. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the bad news this week in this affirmation, and the next week we're going to look at the good news, uh, because Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to get there here in just a minute, a little bit later on in the message, we have what I, I like to call salvation's headline news, because verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2 begins with a little word called and, 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 and we see that it's directly connected to what comes before that, so I, I want you to listen to Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, we see that the news was all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places? Now, what I want you to understand this morning is this. There's more to the good news 
of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and salvation than just the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because that news in and of itself is really good news, isn't it? But here's the thing. It's good news because of the bad news. I mean, have you ever thought, why do we need salvation? I mean, why, why do we need a Savior? Well, those are some questions we're going to answer this morning as we look at this affirmation about man, what we believe about man. So there are three things that I've put in your outline here this morning. No blanks on the three main points, but because there are three things I definitely want you to get this morning. And it's very important. Every word is very important. So three things I want to share with you this morning. Number one, and they're very lengthy, but they're very important. Every word is important. God created man, male and female, in his own image, and free from original sin, that man might have perfect relationship with God and steward his creation. Now, I want you to watch this because we're told in several places, we're going to be in several different places today in Scripture. I know a little bit different than what we're used to, but we're going to be in several different places. And I want you to understand this. I, first of all, I'd like for you to turn to Genesis 1, if you wouldn't mind. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And, and we're told three times here that God created us. Now, we, we all know that. I think we all uh, affirm that. But let me tell you what we're told four times. We're told that God created us, but then here are the great words, in his own image. God created us in his own image. Now, the question is, what in the world does that mean? Well, I mean, what, what does it really mean to be created in the image of God? Well, let me give you a few things. That means that we are spiritual beings. It, it means that we represent and we worship our God who is spirit. Because you and I as human beings, we're, we're more than material beings. We are to relate to God in worship and communication. That also means that we're personal beings, aren't we? I mean, we were created by a personal God. And our personhood, your personhood, my personhood, reflects that aspect uh, of God. He, he created us with, uh, with purpose. And, and though as human beings we all share common characteristics, there are no two of us that are alike. And, and because we're created in the image of God, that gives every life value. That gives every life significance. But we're also moral beings. It means we're moral beings. I mean, look, God is, is holy, right? He created humanity with a moral compass where you uh, understand right from wrong. And even though because of sin, that compass can be deadened or seared, but nonetheless, it remains hardwired in man. Being created in the image of God means that we are relational beings. God, God created us with the capacity to relate to one another, to know one another. You and I were not created to live in this isolated individualism. No, we have the ability to relate in marriage. We have the ability to relate as friends, as members of the body of Christ here in the church, to relate to others in the great commandment and the great commission. But we're also, that means we're rational beings. Our God is a God of knowledge, isn't he? And now, our, our knowledge is obviously... Uh, limited, But nonetheless, we've been created with the ability to think, the ability to, to learn, to know. Christianity is not a mindless faith. It's just the opposite. And then we're emotional beings. We're created in the likeness of God who is love, right? It, it allows us to experience intimacy with those who are uh, close to us. It allows us to feel compassion for one another. It allows us to find our deepest soul satisfaction in God himself. And then it also means that we're creative beings. Now, God is creator, right? He is creator, and his glory is displayed in his uh, creation. And, and I think each one of us have this insatiable desire to create, whether it's producing a piece of, of artwork, whether it's building a building, whether it's writing a book or landscaping a yard. We have this desire to create. All right, so Genesis 1, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Now, question. 
Does God rule? Hello? Does God rule? All right. Does God reign? Yes. Does God have dominion? Yes. So God said, look, I, I want a creature like me. I, I want someone to reign. I, I want someone to have dominion on the earth. So let us make man in our image, right? And let them have dominion. So, so we understand that Adam and Eve were given dominion, right? Over the earth. Adam and Eve to be king and queen. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. To, to sit at the place of authority. And so the word dominion means to rule over it. So, so God gave the first man dominion. But as we're going to see in a moment, he lost it, didn't he? I mean, you got to be honest. Something has gone terribly wrong. I mean, you, you pick up the newspaper this morning. And you watch the news. I mean, you look at the, the crime. The violence, the, the hate, the, the lust, the sorrow, the disappointment is, is everywhere. Think about a little boy who was sitting on the front steps of the school, and he was crying. And the janitor came up to him, and he said, what's wrong, son? Well, the little boy was supposed to bring his birth certificate to school. And his mother told him, she said, listen, she said, this is a very, very important document. Don't you lose it. And he lost it. And so the janitor said, well, well what's wrong? The little boy said, I lost my excuse for being born. Now, let me tell you, that's, that's exactly what Adam had done. Adam lost the reason that God had created him. God, God had made him to have dominion and, and to steward over his creation. We continue on in Genesis 1.27. Notice what's said. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Here it is, male and female, he created them. You, you understand that it was by God's design? God created us, male and female, and he created us with equal dignity. But God created men and women for different roles. Clearly in so many ways in scripture, God created men and women differently. There's a reason why we have male and and female, both in the image of God, but with different roles. And God created us that way. He created us male and female as a reflection of the Trinity, as a reflection of himself. And, and this is where we see the beauty of both our equality and our differences. All right, so you, you're with me so far. Number one, God created man, male and female, in his own image, free from original sin, that man might have perfect relationship with him and steward his creation. All right, so you have to admit, everything's great so far. All right, but here we go, number two. Number two, tempted by Satan, man rebelled against God's command and inherited a nature that is corrupt and wholly opposed to God and is under condemnation. So God gave that dominion to Adam, and what we find out now is that Adam took that dominion that God had given him, and he gave that dominion to Satan. Now, obviously, we know from reading our Bible that what? Satan deceived him, didn't he? I mean, Satan, that con artist, deceived Adam. But nonetheless, Adam, disobedient, unbelieving Adam, yielded to Satan. And what happened is he became Satan's slave. And, and by the way, that's what Genesis 3 is all about. How the serpent crawls on the pages of history and deceives the first man and the first woman. And that word serpent, by the way, means shining one, okay? And so Adam yields himself to Satan. And so Satan says to Adam, look, man, you, you will be like God. But Adam didn't become like God. He became Satan's slave. In Romans chapter 6 is a very important text here because the Apostle Paul explains it this way. Romans 6 verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And so Adam became a slave of Satan. His, his authority was gone. He, he lost his legal right to rule. And now man is spiritually dead and he is spiritually dethroned. 
Now we come to Ephesians 2, verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Adam, who was given life, you see, is now dead. And listen to this. The sons of Adam are dead. Now, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, here's what I want you to understand this morning. All right, This is very, very important. You were born in Adam. You and I are linked to Adam in a very, very important way way. You say, well, Mark, I don't have anything to do with Adam. I didn't vote for Adam. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Of course you do. I mean, if Adam would have died before he had children, would you be here today? No. So you are linked to Adam in a very special, important way. So since you are linked to Adam, since I am linked to Adam, let me tell you what that means for you. Let me tell you what that means for me. Let me show you what you and I lost in Adam. So go. I want you to go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're going to see this. Because I want you to see this morning what Adam gave to us. What he gave to you, what he gave to me. And there are five things here that I want you to write down. Five blanks I want you to fill in in your note sheet. All right, here's what we got from Adam. We got weakness rather than strength. Okay, that's the first thing we got. We got weakness rather than strength. Now, look in Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still weak, let me, I'll just stop right there. Listen to me. Without Jesus, you are without strength. You understand that? Without Jesus, you are without strength. You say, well, Mark, I have strength. Oh, listen, I'm not talking about physical strength. You say, Mark, I have, I have money. I'm not talking about financial strength. You say, Mark, I'm smart. I'm not talking about intellectual strength. You say, Mark, I have a sound mind. No, no, no. I'm not talking about emotional strength. I'm talking about spiritual strength. You do not have the spiritual strength to do what God has called you to do and to be who God has called you to be apart from Christ. I mean, you, you can try as much as you want, but you don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. We lost that strength. And in the place of it, we've been given spiritual weakness. That's the first thing we got from Adam. All right? We've got weakness rather than strength. Secondly, we got ungodliness rather than godliness. We got ungodliness rather than godliness. Look in Romans 5 verse 6 again. For when we were still weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, remember, what, what did God make Adam to be? Godly. What did sin make him? Ungodly, right? Unlike God. I, and, I, and I think, you know what the problem is with many of us? The problem is with many of us, we, we, we measure ourselves by each other. We, we measure ourselves by the wrong standard. We, we say, well... I'm, I'm better than those folks down there at that church, or at least I didn't do what he did, or I didn't, I didn't do what she did. Well, what does that have to do with anything? I mean, the Bible says that if, if you are one of these people who measure yourselves by someone else, you're not very wise, all right, because God's standard is godliness, all right? Do you know what sin is? I'll give you a great definition of sin. The Bible says, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of of God. So the distance between the glory of God and where we are right now, that's sin. The distance between the glory of God and where we are right now, that is sin. So what did we get from Adam? Weakness, ungodliness, then we got sinfulness rather than righteousness. Sinfulness rather than righteousness. Now pick up Romans 5, 7, and 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died 
for us. Now, we said in our churches so many times, we're here, we're, we're dressed up, we have our Bibles in our hands, we look so good. But in Adam, we are sinners. I mean, look, the Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law. You, you may be here this morning and you may not think that you're a sinner, but, but you are. Look, a man is not a liar because he tells lies. He tells lies because he's a liar. In his, in his heart, a man is not a thief because he steals. He steals because he is a thief. It, it's, it's in the heart. The problem is the heart. The Bible says that we are sinners. So what do we get from Adam? Well, we got weakness. We got ungodliness. We got sinfulness. And then we got wrath rather than approval. Wrath rather than approval. Pick up verse 9, Romans 5, verse 9. Since therefore... We have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. D do you know what we are when we're in Adam? We are under the wrath of God. Now, I, I know that we live in a day and age today that you know, we don't like to talk about the wrath of God. People don't like to hear about the wrath of God. We're supposed to tell everybody that God is a God of love. And, and, and he is. He's, he, I mean, he's perfect love. He's, he's infinite love. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. But this text also speaks of the wrath of God, doesn't it? And, and if you preach the love of God to the exclusion of the wrath of God, then you've only preached half the truth. And when you only preach half the truth, that half the truth becomes an untruth. Because some people have the idea that God's going to overlook our sin. Listen to me. He will not. He is a holy God. Some people have the idea that God is going to save everyone. He will not. There are two categories of people, the saved and the lost. And in Adam, you are under the wrath of God. And if you die without Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity in hell. So what did we receive from Adam? Weakness? ungodliness, sinfulness, wrath, and then warfare rather than peace. Warfare rather than peace. Pick up verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You see that? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Do you know what you are if you're not a child of God? You are an enemy of God. You say, well, hold on, Mark. I'm not a Christian, but I'm not an enemy of God. Oh, yes, you are. If you're in Adam, you're an enemy of God. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 30, he said, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. You cannot be neutral when it comes to Jesus Christ. Not to be for him is to be against him. All right, so where are we so far? Number one, God created man, male and female, in his own image, free from original sin, that man might have perfect relationship with him and steward his creation. Number two, tempted by Satan, man rebelled against God's command and inherited a nature that is corrupt and wholly opposed to God and is under condemnation. And here's the final thing I want you to see this morning. That means that all people are lost and without hope, apart from salvation in Christ. All people are lost, and without hope, apart from salvation in Christ. Now, I'm well aware this morning that by me standing up here telling you that man is lost, I've stepped on a politically incorrect, and some would say a spiritually incorrect landmine. Listen to what one famous preacher said. Said. He said, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelistic enterprise than the unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. I say, give me a break. If that, if that statement is true... 
then the Apostle Paul is, is the most unchristian individual in history because he gives a devastating description of the spiritual condition that, that afflicts every person from the time they're born. I mean, the Apostle Paul says that, that man is spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, verse 1, he says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, every person that comes into this world is born, D-O-A, dead on arrival, okay? They are alive physically, but they are dead spiritually. Now, it's, it's not that, that people are just not on God's wavelength when they're born. The problem's deeper. Their antenna is completely down. They can't even receive a, a signal. I heard uh, there was a chicken farmer who was losing a lot of his flock, and he wrote a letter to the Department of Agriculture and said this, Gentlemen, something's wrong with my chickens. Every morning when I come out, I find two or three lying on the ground, cold and stiff, with their feet in the air. Can you tell me what's the matter? Three months later, the reply came back from Washington. Dear sir, your chickens are dead. Now listen to me. There's one thing that's true about you right now. Either you are dead or you were dead. Either you are dead or you were dead. Verse 1 speaks of your past or your present. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, I'll tell you what you are. You are a dead man walking. Every home without Jesus Christ is a funeral home. Every person in that home, apart from Christ, is a corpse. Every bed in that home that slept in is a casket. We are spiritually dead apart from from Jesus Christ. But man's also spiritually depraved. Paul says that a, that a lost person is controlled by three things. He's controlled by the world. He says this in verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. See, from the time you're born, if you don't trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Savior you'll not only live in this world, but you'll live for this world. And you will think like this world. Because there's only two ways you can walk in this life. You can either walk according to the word, or you can walk according to the world. So you and I as believers can't be surprised by the way the world acts or thinks or talks. It's just doing what comes naturally. But a lost man is also controlled by the devil. He says, verse 2, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. See, the, the world will teach you to sin, and the devil will tempt you to sin. And you and I know this is true. We can see the devil's handiwork all around us. But the lost man is also controlled by the flesh. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So the world will teach you to sin. The devil will tempt you to sin, but the flesh will take you to sin. And, and see, here's the thing. The lost man is not only corrupted from the outside in, he's corrupted from the inside out. And, and I can assure you this morning, we can do just fine. We can sin just fine without any help from the world or the devil. And you take, for example, the little boy who was being disciplined by his mother for kicking his sister in the shins and pulling her hair. And, and his mother said, son, why did you let the devil make you kick her and pull her hair? And he said, well, mom, the, the devil made me kick her, but pulling her hair was my idea. <laughs> a, a, lot of, a lot of times, look, sin is our idea because we live according to the flesh. But the lost man is also spiritually doomed. Verse 3. And we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. See, look, folks, we're not only sinners by choice, sinners by practice. But man, we're sinners by nature. We sin because it's our nature to sin. You don't have to tell children, to teach children to lie, cheat, or steal. You have to teach them not to lie, cheat, or steal because that's their nature. And because we're sinners by nature, we are children 
of wrath. We're not born children of God. We're born children of wrath. We must be born again to be children of God. So here's the bad news this morning. The, the bad news is that man is lost. That's our condition. But listen to me, man. The, the glorious part, we're going to say for next week, because we can be condemned by one man, we can also be saved by one man. And his name is Jesus. And he came to give us much more than we ever lost in Adam. I mean, in Christ, we have life. We have forgiveness. We have reconciliation. And we have righteousness. Let me put this scenario before you as we close. You are on the railroad track this morning. Your car has stalled. The train is coming at a great velocity. And, and look, there you are. If you remain in the car, it's sudden death. So you can get out of the car or you can stay in the car. Now, you don't have to decide whether or not you're going to die. That's already decided if, if you don't get out of the car. You can get out or die. Listen to me very carefully. You are already in Adam, all you have to do, all you have to do to die and go to hell is to stay right where you are. I mean, you're, you're already there. The decision is, am I going to get out of Adam and am I going to get in to Christ? That's the decision. Because in Adam, all die and you are already under condemnation. The train is coming. But here's the thing. This Jesus who came, who died on the cross to pay your sin debt, he says, look, you come to me. You come to me, he says, if you'll turn from your sin, you'll place your faith and trust in me. I will save you. I will forgive you. I will set you free, and I'll give you so much more than you ever lost in Adam. If you bow your heads with me, let's pray together this morning.